This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Two more uh, brief talks. Uh, one first by uh, Byron Washam, who uh, is my colleague on the uh, program chair, along with uh, Matt St. Clair, who is here. Byron's going to talk to us about, uh, he's going to summarize some of the big challenges that we've been addressing. And then uh, we'll follow that with uh, uh, Susanna Hecht, who's going to talk about the natural ecosystem, especially the issue of how we need to encompass that natural system, forests especially, into our total picture of what we're doing with the uh, planet and greenhouse gas emissions and absorption. Byron. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. As a uh, wrap-up speaker, I'd like to blend a number of things that, uh, slides that you've already seen today. You saw Rachel's uh, uh, presentation earlier, uh, where the goals are and where we need to get by 2025. and. We didn't have a line that went from where we are down to there. Rom mentioned this morning where we had two segments of between now and 2030 and the segment of 2030 to 2015, which will be the, the, the area of my focus in this presentation. But every single presentation had a contributing factor to what I'd like to share with you. And that is, what are the challenges of scaling a reduction of our carbon emissions by 80% by 20? And this is, uh, very simply put, in a technology push of accelerating technology as well as a market pull of embracing that very same technology. This is a vision of the future. Distributed generation, uh, energy storage, car sharing, a whole variety of different technologies that perform in an orchestrated fashion to provide the different uh, <clears throat> supply, the demand, the storage, the demand response, all the composites of what makes an orchestrated, optimized, harmonized grid. And for, for those of you who went on the microgrid tour, here's a 10 second view of a DC fast charger, 5.5 uh, 5 megawatt hours of energy storage, electric chillers locally produced, compressed natural gas or biogas for transportation, uh, directed biogas fuel cell, all within a thermal energy storage to provide uh, local district heating and cooling. This is an idea of just showing what is the art of the possible with present technology. But as Scott Samuelson mentioned, that we have maturing technology. We've seen volume curves that will drive down the price. We have to go far beyond that. If we look at <clears throat> Denmark, on the left is the slide of Denmark. Their distributed generation is very little and centralized generation is very uh, large. 15 years later in 2009, you see all the different points of distributed generation. It looks like the country caught the measles. I contend that this is exactly what California, United States, and the world will look like within 15 years. I'm surprised, very much surprised, that I'm one of the last speakers of the day and nobody has previously shown the duck curve. The duck curve is a phenomena where with the increase in renewable portfolio standards, we'll actually see during the middle of the day a reduction <clears throat> in the demand for uh, conventional generation. It has to actually draw back. And so rather than curtail that surplus of electricity being generated by renewables, what we want to do is find load sinks, be it production of hydrogen, be it production of desalination, but find these load sinks that can bring a new use into play. 
So I forever want to be known as the man who invented the EV happy hour. <laughs> it needs no explanation. When you have a surplus, you have flex charging. And that's exactly when you want to charge your EVs. But we will see, and this is a little contrarian to previous papers, we will see a serial disruptive and transformative technologies in all fields of innovation. And here is a business model <clears throat> from the computer industry that you notice the different lines don't overlap. They don't feed into each other. You progressively go on. It's a stair step. I contend this is exactly what we'll see in the different technologies that we're looking for in the 2030 to 2050 timeframe. And then what we need is market pull. Whether it's non-price incentives like we just heard about or whether it's price incentives or it's market regulations, the second part of this curve is very important. It didn't show up on this slide. But it's a normal bell-shaped curve that goes the entire bandwidth of this. And that's the normal market maturation. We simply do not have time for the normal mat maturation. We must find accelerants to the market pull of accepting this technology far beyond price. And that creates things like the red curve on the left. And that is where you have what we call the Big Bang market adoption. In 2010, in November 2010, was the first commercial sale of an Apple iPad. 50 years ago, I mean five years ago. Over 200 million have been sold. Apple originally had 67% of the market. They now have 27%. Competition, innovation, technology, big bang. We need a big bang. And in the audience today is Nancy Skinner. While she was in the legislature, she introduced AB 2514, which required 1.2 gigawatts of energy storage to be installed. Southern California Edison, in response to this, put out a request for a proposal for 60 megawatts of something they didn't particularly want to buy 60 megawatts of. After the bids were reviewed, they selected 260 megawatts of energy storage, almost four times the amount requested. Why? Because the presentation of the packaging of energy storage, its variety of uses, its financing options really unveiled, or as some would say, took off their blinders as the way they approached energy storage. Of that, only 163 of those 260 megawatts are for the utilities. The balance is for behind the meter. That is a big bang. That was created by legislation and regulation, but it, as you could have seen in the microgrid tour today, that was an example of the art of the possible. And that's exactly what we need in the future. Thank you. Since we have two different topics here, um, I think it would be appropriate to take some questions first for Byron, and then we'll move to Susanna's talk. So you go back to the, okay. over there. <laughs> questions for Byron? Big bang question. In the back. Oh, yes, a big bang question. Uh, um, Coming, my name is Robin Raj from the area of uh, communications, and um, I would just make the observation that that presentation pertaining to the Big Bang, to me, embedded within that is the basis for a communication strategy. Perhaps the first one 
you know, I, I've heard whereby it can move the market and we can get strategic about audience definition, audience strategies, because for much of the talk talking about messages, messages and messengers, segmenting our audience with a directed purpose um, around the acceleration there. And um, I won't bore you with stories, but I, I had worked at the agency that worked for Apple, and uh, there was a period of time when Apple was at 1% <laughs> market penetration to, uh, to Microsoft. But uh, with the product innovation, but then with the combination of product and communication, uh, you know, we've seen transformation. Clearly, the product innovation is here, but the communication is uh, needs to be commensurate with it. And I just make that observation. Okay. I think Nancy had a question here. Yes, Nancy. Is there another either policy driver or technology that you can uh, imagine or speculate for us that could create this kind of big bang? Uh, I would go back to uh, Scott Samuelson uh, blurred list of I think he had 13 different uh, uh, items of and every single one of them have multiple technologies in them and the portfolio approach is really diversification of your generation resources diversification of your energy storage resources big small variety diversification of electric, electric or hydrogen um, uh, cars, diversification of uh, your energy efficiency devices, on and on and on. Diversification brings four things. Reliability, survivability, resiliency, and safety. And here at UC San Diego, what wasn't mentioned, that we produce our electricity at half the pr price of being a wholesale direct access customer at 25% below the California greenhouse gas emissions. So you take those four essentials of customer demand plus the ability of smaller and smaller technologies to have the same efficiency and the same price points, why wouldn't you do it? Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Okay. <laughs> We always save the best for last. So Susanna is now going to tell us about the Big Bang having to do with the natural ecosystem. And I've heard her talk. There's some neat stuff she's going to tell you. Well, first of all, um, I'm also tremendously honored to be invited, and especially because I'm not talking about any kind of new invention. After all, trees have already been invented. So this saves a lot of time. You don't have to, you know, and while there certainly is a valley of death around forestry, um, on the other hand, there's also a great deal of salvation with it as well. Well, um, I want to keep us up on current events here. And of course, this is Patricia that we all um, have seen uh, and, and experienced, actually, the icky humidity of the last few days for us ca Southern Californians, our little tendrils of Patricia. But across the uh, Pacific, um, there's another story going on. <clears throat> and the, the uh, I mean, I, I thought, oh, but this is such an attractive person. I can't really put this on now after hearing TV, but it's too late. Um, in any case, what we have in Indonesia right now is an extraordinary dynamic of deforestation, which is causing um, massive haze over Southeast Asia. Yes, it's a beautiful set of embers. And now I'm like so traumatized from teeny, I don't know what to do with the rest of my PowerPoint. <laughs> but anyway, I'll just try and go forward. Uh, you know, soldiering on, as it were. Uh, however, some of these are, are sort of less attractive given the level of haze. And this is, of course, cause, there are some sort of, oh, well, we'll just have a few air filtration places but, and a few clinics, but this hardly uh, matches the population of Kalimantan, for example. And the other thing is, uh, oh, well, just take people on boats and uh, float them somewhere where the haze isn't. This doesn't really have the air of a really practical solution, but you can see that people are really, uh, fortunately he's still smoking, so he might not notice that the haze is so big. 
But in any case, we, we continue forward. Um, but you can see even in urban areas as opposed to rural areas where they're actually burning, this is causing extraordinary difficulties. Planes can't fly. Even the tragedy of the president of Indonesia flying to Kalimantan, he couldn't land because of the visibility problems. So we might want to say, well, Maybe this is just a little local thing and what do we care anyway? But what you can see here is that these fires are generating enough emissions that they're greater than the US emissions. So the point really about this is that it's important that we do what we do, but perhaps on a certain level it's not entirely about us. But also when you look at these kinds of dynamics, one is, oh, at least I hear the echo, <laughs> perhaps not, perhaps you don't have this problem, but I have the echo of Marlena Dietrich speaking to Orson Welles in that fabulous movie, <laughs> A Touch of Evil, where she says to him, future, you have no future, your future is all used up. So when you see these kinds of things and the massive dynamics that they entail, one might um, hear that little line of Marlena's. However, I um, also spend a lot of time in Brazil where people are really kind of cheery in spite in the face of massive difficulties. And so let me um, switch a little bit to another story. Now, we have a sort of, as my environmental humanist friends would say, a narrative of declension about uh, tropical forests in the New World. Now, what's interesting about this is, of course, you can see those red hot spots and you go, oh yeah, that's deforestation. But you might not be so aware of how much blue there is. And the blue is forest recovery. The red is really the expansion of the soybean and corn and sugar cane world. So those are for biofuels, they're for feeding animals um, for the most part. and. Uh, um, it's important to realize also when we look at these kinds of things and we think about them to remember, at least in the case of Brazil, that this was a, a place that has something like 90% of its en energy has historically been from um, hydro sources. It was also the first place of the bio-renewable car fuels, which were from sugarcane. It does help to have grown sugarcane for 500 years and have a really good sugarcane lobby who would like you to switch from petroleum to sugarcane. So there's always are these political economies that we might want to spend some time looking at. But the point that I want to talk about is really we're sort of looking at forests lost and found. So what I'd like to explore with you very quickly here is a rather unusual dynamic. One is, this is my favorite river, the Purus River, and uh, it winds around, it's in, the, it's in the upper Amazon. And what you might not know from looking at it, it is this, this was one of the most intensely, it was like the heart of industrial globalization during the rubber period. Well, you wouldn't have that, you wouldn't have that sense of it right now. And it really was uh, only about 100 years ago that this place was met quite extensively deforested and quite extensively degraded. So it proves um, the adage of one of my major professors as I was uh, in graduate school at Berkeley, who said, in forestry as it happened, who said, you know, Susanna, you could get into a lather about deforestation, but trees grow. So that's one thing to keep in mind with the rest of the story I'm about to tell you. Um, if you look at the de deforestation in Amazonia, of course you'll see um, you know, the forests and flames and everything. But usually what they're not telling you is that actually not just in the Brazilian Amazon, but in all the circum-Amazonian countries, there's a little uptick right now in Peru, but in any case, um, what you see is a rather surprising decline in deforestation. Now, when I look at this, I say, hmm, this doesn't look like individual behaviors. This looks like structural change. So what are we seeing here? And if you look at the case of Brazil, one of the things that you're seeing very strongly is that in 2004, you looked like you were having the, uh, the upward tick forever and the end of the, and many people were predicting the end of the rainforest. I certainly would not have taken the bet had someone offered it to say, well, do you think in a, a little more than a decade that 
the rate of deforestation will be cut by 80%. I would have said, too much ayahuasca for you, bub. You, you know, no, no, I'm not taking that bet. But I would have been a dope to not take it because this is indeed, in fact, what happened. So how do we explain these two graphs? Well, um, first of all, you do have to look at structural change to some degree. And part of this involved, um, and I love this, uh, this is Raoni, a, a Kayapo um, um, a chief who was working on the legislation for the Constitutional Convention in Brazil in 1988, just that time when Jim Hansen was um, screaming about everything being a mess. So they developed a new constitution which was quite inclusive, including things like, and, and people like um, Chico Mendes. So what you had there were social movements involving traditional people that were written and integrated into their constitutions. So we might sort of imagine what that what these kinds of things uh, might have. And it's important to realize that it's still early days in sort of post-authoritarian um, nation building in Latin America since um, really the, we're looking, the last peace accords were signed in 1996. So it's, if it were the US, we'd still be in the 18th century. So the point is that you had a lot of social movements engaged in stopping deforestation. Now they could say a few things about climate and they could say a few things about microclimate, but what was really important to them were another set of issues which had to do with tenurial questions it had to do with autonomy, it had to do with livelihoods. So um, just to make sure also that we don't end up simplifying the narrative, Li Fong came and said, Susanna, this is many two words on that, on those you know, slides, no one's gonna read them. Well, I don't expect you to read them, I'm just sort of throwing them at you as sort of a thing to give you a sense of the kinds of processes that go into bending that curve. We sort of make it seem like it's a little bit, you know, if we just could just think harder or something, it would all work, or maybe say it better. But in fact, there's a lot of uh, uh, things operating at every scale, from the most local to the international, and also between uh, accords of states and accords of nation states, as well as popular political movements. The thing that I would want to say is that it's important to have legal mechanisms, um, Subnational agreements were really important in terms of turning that thing around so that you could have uh, the state of Amazonas agreeing with the state of uh, California uh, making a treaty about sort of future comportment vis-a-vis -vis, uh, questions of climate. There's technology in here, of course, with monitoring and so on, but there's also a kind of social responsibility as well. The other thing I would argue, too, that we haven't spoken about too much in terms of these things are questions of livelihoods, of questions of green markets, questions of environmental services that seem to have sort of gotten lost in the story about mitigation and adaptation. Um, the other thing that I think is also important is that there are a lot of policies that went into place such as the Bolsa Familia, which is a family support thing that meant that people didn't necessarily have to sit and chop down forest um, all the time to ensure their food, um, and what's called the Sesta Basica, which is a basic bunch of food that was given to people. But the point here is that there are a lot of other kinds of spillovers, and a lot of the structural changes, which I'm gonna go to in a minute, and the policies were not necessarily climate policies, but they had, poli they had climate spillovers and very important ones. If you're going from something where the Brazilian deforestation was really about 21% of global emissions in, in 2004, and you drop that by 80%, in a little more than a decade, we have to say that of the, la the interventions in the last decade, that has to be one of the most important climate mitigation uh, dynamics that's occurred. The next thing that also I want to recommend that you pay attention to, because in the tropics we get so caught up in the sort of preservationist language, is these policies were formatted for inhabited environments. So this is not just a story about set-asides and forests sucking down carbon, 
quietly by themselves <laughs> off in the upper Amazon, but rather in uh, engagement in uh, things, I hate the term socio-natures, but this is really one of these things which is an outcome of both the natural environment and human agency, and also non-human agency as well. So there's another thing, a uh, place that I work a lot. It's the sort of Malthusian nightmare of, El, of El Salvador, which should be a big total mess because it's so densely populated and everything. Well, this again is another sort of decadal story where basically it goes from um, 19, uh, uh, 1996, which is the sort of red, you know, acne colored country and then it turns into this delightful green thing later on. Now there's clearly deforestation going on and there's also vegetation change, but the point here is that even very densely populated places, and this is densely populated and continues to be densely populated, even such places can have quite a bit of forest cover. So how do we explain this? Because after all, we are so accustomed to Malthus, it's hard to stop, you know? Anyway, um, first of all, big structural changes in the economies. I'm not going to go into this in too, in too much detail, but essentially you go from being an agrarian economy to being, whether one likes it or not, a remittance economy and a, um, you know, a, 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 some manufacture and tourism and other kinds of services, banking services for the most part. So one of the things is that changes these things are structural change. So one of the things is to think about how you can integrate climate questions into international development, although that wasn't part of these stories by any means, by the way. Um, what was part of these stories is the age of migration. Um, we're looking at about a billion people uh, migrating both nationally and internationally every year. So we are in a world in motion. Um, there's a lot of money that goes with migration, and while we sort of think about how expensive it is to go from Syria to Germany, um, one of the dynamics of migration that we see globally, uh, once you move out of those war zones, is that the flow of money is going, a large flow of money, now close to $700 billion, is going from my, uh, places uh, that receive migrants to non-migrant places. Um, oh, I see this light is going on. So I'm going to just go really fast. Anyway, so the point being that this is the size of a, about the size of a, a, of a, a European country, and it's vastly changed the dynamics of these countries as well. The other thing is urbanization. It's much more linked to rural areas. It's much more complex got multi-sided households. It's important to realize that what we're seeing is not just with this structural change that people forget forests. 1.4 billion people are still forest dependent, but that the dynamics of these economies have shifted. So I think um, this sort of says it all. Once you start to get remittances, you see less forest clearing, a lot more forest resurgence. One more thing about this, because with this forest recovery, you get most of your biomass accumulation in the first 20 or 25 years. So that actually we're having a very dynamic moment in global climates, even though we don't realize we're being incredibly helped by a lot of structural dynamics and social dynamics that both have slowed deforestation and that have contributed to forest resurgence. And management makes a difference here. I won't go into detail. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm merely showing you what a really great agroforestry system looks like and why we might think about these as being central to our future as well as the future of lots of tropical people.